I don't know about you, but you made it through this week and God deserves a praise. There may have been some ups and downs. Some things probably did not go as, as planned, but God was still in control every moment of your life. And I just wanna say, we deserve to give him praise on this morning. He is the King of Kings. He is a beautiful God. He loves every single one of you. He loves every single last one of us and we deserve to give him praise on this morning. You know, th those weeks can, sometimes in life, man, things just happen throughout the week. Things could have went a whole lot worse this week. But I promise you, Jesus, God was with us every step of the way. Amen. Amen. I am excited to stand before you and speak God's word. I've been praying through the passage. I've been praying through the message, and I'm just excited about it. We are traveling through the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts because Acts is what happened after Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He gave his church a mission. He gave his church a mandate. He gave his church power, and we are able to look at his scriptures and see how the church exploded. Acts is about 35 years worth of work summed up into these chapters that we can read. It is a beautiful, beautiful story. We see the church exploding. We see the church expanding. I mean, from city to city, from country to country, not because of these men were just so brilliant or just so intelligent, it's because the power of God was on the inside of them and the power of God filled them and they were just excited to tell people wonderful things about Jesus. That's how the church grows. It grows when we are filled with his spirit and the only thing that can come out is how good God is. <laughs> that's, that, that's how the church grew. And so we are about to park in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42 on this morning. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42. I'll read from the New Living Translation. Scripture says that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had in common. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I would like to tag this text, the perfect church. The perfect church. Background for a second. So we just experienced Pentecost. 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. Before that, it was about 120 people in the house upstairs praising God. So if you're a numbers person, I have my deacon here, he's a math teacher, 3,000 plus 120, I think is 3,120. <laughs> <laughs> so the church has grown to 3,120, give or take. And now God has found it to where they're about to form a community. This is the church. 
Watch this. Jesus is not physically present, but his spirit has filled them and the church has expanded. And so now they have to put some structure in place. They have to put some principles in place. And right here, we see in this text how they did that. It's right there in the text. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they are the church. 3,000 people. <laughs> and now they have to do that. The perfect church. See, the church, let's, let's define the church. The church is a family of families. The church is the bride of Christ. One day, Jesus will come back for his bride. That is you and I. If you look at it like a marriage, one day he will marry us. There will be a beautiful day when he comes back for every single last one of us. The church is the bride of Christ. That's who we are. We are committed to him as a body. This is the perfect church that we are about to see what they devote themselves to. So let's talk about devotion real quick because these are a couple of words that I believe that we really have to hone in on. Devotion, watch this, means a sense of urgency. All right, so this church has a sense of urgency. The bride of Christ has a sense of urgency to the person that they are about to marry, which is Jesus. Let's think about the perfect bride for a second. The perfect wife, all right? Some people may consider the perfect wife to be all beautiful on the outside. I remember when I was looking for a wife, a little young whippersnapper, didn't, didn't know nothing. Josh, I was, I was just looking. I was looking for all the things on the outside, though. And then I was taught by a wise woman that it ain't all about the outside, it's also about the inside. I'm reminded of a passage of Scripture. Proverbs 31 talks about what a beautiful woman of God looks like. Man, that woman, she is trustworthy. Trustworthy. She, you can trust this woman. This woman, she's an entrepreneur at heart. This woman is a beautiful woman on the inside. She, she can do things that other people cannot do. The scripture says in Proverbs 31 that she is a hardworking woman. That doesn't mean she's just at the house washing dishes. She can think for herself. She can she can make things happen because she is a, a beautiful woman made by God. This woman is beautiful, like my woman, you know, she, she beautiful. Not just on the outside, but also on the inside. What I am getting to is if our church is the bride of Christ, then we also have to examine what our church looks like. What kind of bride are we to Jesus? Are we a trustworthy church or what the scripture also says in Proverbs 31 that the, 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 the virtuous woman, she also cares for the poor? What, what kind of church are we? Are we that church that will take every single step to go help those that are in need? Are we the type of church that people can come to and say, I trust those people? What kind of church are we? What kind of church do we desire to be? It's a perfect church that we see in Acts. Scripture says that, the first point, they were devoted to the apostles' teachings. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. See, we, we, can, we can brush right over that and be like, okay, we're, they're devoted, they're devoted to the apostles' teachings. Good, that's just the word of God. No, but let's, let's unpack the apostles' teachings for a second. The apostles' teachings. The apostles right now are the 12 disciples. They're 
They're, they're those who God has, has chosen. They are the apostles, those that walked with Jesus, physically walked with Jesus and ate with Jesus and went through things with Jesus and they learned from Jesus himself. The church is devoting themselves to what they taught. So what did they teach is the question. Well, I could say, go read the New Testament and go check out everything that all the apostles did and then you will see what they taught, but I really wouldn't be a good pastor if I did that. So I'm gonna summarize to you what they taught. They taught to take off the old and put on the new. See, if we are going to be devoted to Jesus, if we are going to be a devoted church, watch this, I promise you this, we cannot be focused on the old self. We have to take off the old self and put on the new self. See, when we believe in Jesus, we repent of our sins, we commit to change. We have to leave the old person where they were and we have to start walking towards newness in Christ. They taught to leave the old self. I promise you this, if I was my old self, Tasia probably wouldn't be with me right now. You have to be committed to who God has called you to be. That's what the apostles taught. They said, take off the old and put on the new. They also taught about producing fruit of the Spirit. Interesting. Love, joy, peace, Patience, self-control, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, and gladness. We are to produce those things. Watch this, bro. If I cannot be producing love if I'm always hating on somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have to be kind if I want the fruit to come out of me. They, the apostles taught to be kind, to be loving, not to be rude and all mad. Imagine if you had somebody at the front door just mad and looking at everybody all crazy. I mean, it don't work. Matter of fact, what if you was just in your house and somebody came over your house and you just mad all the time? We have to produce. <laughs> we have to produce the fruit. The apostles taught, they were devoted to this. Now understand this, I'm not saying we perfect. No, 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 we, we, we mess up all the time, but there is a standard of living. There's a standard. It just say, you know, God, God gives us how we should live, and it's up to us to respond to that. If we don't respond to it, it's on us, <laughs> and consequences come with it. It's just, I'm just being honest with you. I can't preach the candy gospel. So, 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 so the apostles, they taught to um, take off the old and put on the new. They taught to produce the Holy, uh, they, they taught to produce the fruit of the Spirit. They also spoke about family order. If you look in the text, they tell you about what the family looks like. Watch this, the husband is supposed to love the wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what the apostles taught. That means you love your wife. My Bible say, watch this, if any of y'all think about getting married, I don't know where you at, or maybe you just need a little refreshener on what a husband is, watch this. My Bible say that a, a good husband will be willing to do what Jesus did for the church, and that is to die for her. So if, you re if, if you're thinking about marriage, and you ain't willing to die for your spouse, you might want to chill out for a second. <laughs> Love your wife. Wives? Now here's a highly debated one. Look at y'all already laughing. Like, what is he going to say? <laughs> Wives? Submit to your husbands. I can't wait to dive more into that. But just know that submit don't mean be a tyrant. All right. uh, you have to do whatever they say. Tie my shoes. <laughs> I, mean, I wish I would tell you to tie my shoes. See what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture says, fathers, do not over punish your children. We, we have to watch that, right? We can't just be beating our kids. Sit down, be quiet. We can't do that. We, we have to love our kids. And it also says that parents are to teach their kids the word of God. Some of us go all over the world trying to figure out how to parent, and it's already in Scripture. 
Don't over, don't be overbearing to your kids and teach them the word of God. That's, that's biblical parenting right there. And then children, y'all ready? Obey your parents. See, parents love that part. <laughs> Obey your parents because they love you. That's the, what the apostles taught. If you read throughout the scriptures of the New Testament, they said it over and over and over again. Watch this. They also taught on how we ought to deal with the government. <laughs> I can't read it today, sister. <laughs> we ought to deal with the government. Peter said, honor Caesar. It's a lot to that, by the way, because Caesar wasn't just no nice guy. Caesar killed people. Caesar broke families up. Caesar was not a good guy. So in order for Peter to say, honor Caesar, that, 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 that was a lot into that. It, it wasn't just no, oh, yay, we're going to honor. No, 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 he, he was a bad guy. So if, if Peter can say, honor Caesar during that time, then surely if you have an issue with any of the presidential candidates, you should still respect them. It's all good. I, I can't wait to do a God and government series. <laughs> it don't matter if you would, if you would, it don't matter if Trump is the president or Biden, we still ought to respect them. That's what the apostles were teaching, to respect government. The apostles also taught to watch out for the devil. You do know that the devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy you. That's, that, that's his purpose. He wants you to die. He wants to take from you. He wants to take love from you. He wants to take everything that God, he wants to snatch it away so that you, can, so that you will have no peace. That's what he wants to do. So you got to watch out for him. The apostles also talk about how we should act around outsiders. You can't act. See, yes, we have freedoms in Jesus, but you can't act a fool around people who don't believe in Jesus. You know, um, one of the scriptures that, that, that I really enjoy, um, and it's highly debatable, um, and so um, it's, it's about drinking and alcohol and stuff like that. And some people will say, well, you can drink alcohol and you can do this, or well, you can't do that and all this type of stuff. Scripture says this. Scripture says that um, some of the believers in the first century did not eat meat around other believers because it could cause the other believer to fall. See, they were offering meat as a way to come into the church because then nobody had no food. People were dying of starvation. And so they will offer you meat to come in. But they, watch this, it was their evangelism strategy. So they would bring you in, offer you food, because people like free food, but then they would tell you what their doctrine is. And that could cause a believer to stumble. So the leaders had to say, I'm not going to go eat their food because it could cause my brother to stumble. See, I know I can eat the food, but I don't know if I can eat the food around somebody else because it may make them fall back in their faith. So I don't care what it is, what kind of freedom you got, watch this. It should not make our brother and sister fall. Church relationships is what the apostles taught. They taught about church government and church structure. You know, Jesus just didn't die and say, have at it. <laughs> no, no, he assigned structure to the church. And he also talked about how we ought to treat one another. There is an administration to the mystery found in the text. We're going to deal with that um, on one day as well. This is what the apostles taught, and watch this. The people, the 3,120 people, they were devoted to God's word to glorify Jesus. There is, a, there is a basic first principles of the faith that we ought to be believing in and living by. The perfect church lives by God's word. The perfect bride lives by God's scriptures. Now, I'm not saying that you ain't going to make no mistakes. Please don't think I'm trying to say that. 
But what I am saying is that there is a standard. And we ought to be trying to get to that standard. The next point I have in this particular text, in this passage, it says that the believers were devoted to fellowship. Now, I like this one. It's really good. Imagine the foster child, the child who is being fostered, right? Uh, Our hearts goes out to children that do not have any parents. I would hope your heart goes out to them right? If that child does not have a parent, we really want that child to be in a good, nurturing family. We desire that. We, we're going to pray for that. We're, we, we, we will probably do anything we can to make sure that that happens. Watch this, because we know that a child can't raise themselves. We know that. And so we desire for that child to be in a loving and nurturing place. The reason I'm bringing this up is because some believers believe that they can live a life in Christianity with no Christian family. I could just be spiritual and not talk to nobody. That is not how God designed the family of faith. He designed the family of faith so that we would grow with one another. He, wanted, he wants the people of God to be nurtured around beautiful and loving people so that they can grow up in Christ. Not to be out there all by yourself. This is a crazy world. I promise you, you don't want to be out there by yourself. Is anyone familiar with redwood trees? California. California. All right, yeah. In California, they have these redwood trees. There's some very beautiful trees. These trees, they're so big. It's like 20 or some trees all together in one. And if you look at these trees from a distance, you just say, oh, my God, it is so beautiful. Interesting thing about redwood trees is that underneath the roots are intertwined with one another. That's why the trees are able to come together and be so strong. All the trees have come together to be one tree because the trees understand that they need one another. That's how the church should look. The church should be intertwined with its roots. Watch this. The redwood trees can withstand storms. (laughs) When the storm comes, because the storm does come in life. And so when the storm comes, these trees, the redwood trees, are able to withstand that storm because their roots are intertwined, because they are together as one. They are a family. That is the church. That's the perfect church. Let's talk about what biblical fellowship is not, all right? Uh, biblical fellowship is not, watch this, just hanging out with each other. You know, high five. <laughs> That's not biblical fellowship. Biblical fellowship is when we come together and we have come together to glorify Jesus Christ. We are sharing our lives and letting Jesus be the center of it, okay? Um, we went, we went to go hang out, Randall, Anna, uh, Tejo, and myself, right? We, we went to um, a, a place here, Brick and Borsch, B&B. We went to B&B, okay? <laughs> All right? And so, and, and so, watch this. We started out hanging out. Just cool, exchanging, you know, some stories. This is how we grew up in life. It was, it was real cool. We talked about sports, football was coming up. You know, we were talking about, you know, Tejo can't stay in a live football game. And, you know, R- Randall was telling us some stuff. And I mean, that we were all having work. We were just hanging out. But let me tell you where it shifted is when we start sharing our lives with one another. That's biblical fellowship is when I share my life with you, I can share, watch this, I was able to share with them some of my past hurts when I was 15 years old. 
And interestingly, they had some similar experiences and we were able to watch this, have fellowship and know that God is still in control. See, it's just not about high five it and then you go home, you know, go to Waffle House in the morning and eat some, you know, some hash browns and then all okay, I'll see you next week. That, that's, that's hanging out. And I ain't saying don't hang out. Go have fun tonight, Super Bowl party. That's cool. I'm just trying to make sure we know the difference between hanging out and biblical fellowship. God desires that we have biblical fellowship with one another. He desires that we live our lives centered around Christ with one another. We cannot live our lives centered around Christ without lifting up Christ. So if Jesus is not mentioned, it ain't no fellowship. Next point, they were devoted to worship. We see it right there in the passage 42 through 47. They were devoted to worship. They were devoted to prayer. They were in constant communication with their father. Watch this, devoted means uh, in, in constant, being constant, being um, active in that, being, um, having a sense of urgency. Our prayer lives should have a sense of urgency if we desire to worship. The, these people were so devoted to worship and praying to God and loving one another. Watch this. They even sold property, John. <laughs> like, I sold my house so you wouldn't be homeless. If someone was dealing with a special need, they came together to meet those needs. They didn't have to go to the deacons and say, hey, we want to apply for our light bill. No. They had a special need and the people of God came together right then and fulfilled it and they did it every day. <laughs> That's true worship. Every day, not just on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is an example of what worship looks like, but this perfect church was worshiping every single day, which is why God added to their church every single day. This is not the only time that worship happens in this building. Y'all know that? Sunday morning is not the only time of worship here. <laughs> I've been hanging out with Lewis, checking out what he does. Lewis, he leads uh, Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights here in this building. Let me tell y'all about Celebrate Recovery for a second. They walk in there and they're worshiping God. There's praise and worship going on. There's an A selection, a B selection, and then they come up there and then they'll pray. And then they go back into worship and they praise God, and they say beautiful things about God. They, they're loving on God. Hands are lifted during this time. Watch this. Then, in my opinion, their pastor comes up, and he may, he may do it, or he may have someone else scheduled to do it, and then watch this. They teach biblical scripture. So we have worship, we have prayer, we have praise, we have worship, we have teaching. Watch this, they ain't done. They teach, they go back into worship, and this is what I really love about Monday nights. Then they go into groups to talk about what is going on on the inside of them. They share life with one another. They just don't go home and that's it. No, no, no. They are intentional about attacking what's going on. I wonder if the church could actually look like that. What if we had groups that I could really share this is what's going on with my life, but sometimes we're too closed up to share those things. See, see, Lewis and his people I'm saying his people because God has entrusted those people to him. Lewis and his people, they have a sense of urgency to going to God about their issues. Yet sometimes in the American church, we don't even talk about issues. We just sweep them under the rug. 
That's what worship looks like. They're devoted to worship. Last thing, they are devoted to missions. It's right there in verse 47. God added to the church every single day. God blessed their missional or outreach activity. They just weren't sitting around, oh, yeah, looks great today. <laughs> no, they were getting out and loving people and being genuine. They were getting outside of their actual comfort zone, and they were getting out, and God was adding people to the church every day. He blessed their missional and outreach activity. God added to the church every single day. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's the perfect church. Now, here it is. What kind of church are we? What type of church do we desire to be? Do we desire to be loving? Do we desire to be devoted to his scripture? I mean, take God's scripture. Have a sense of urgency to get to him. Have a sense of urgency to worship him. Have a sense of urgency to pray to him to be able to take some time out of my week and say, God, I give it all to you. Because honestly, sometimes when we're going throughout our week and it's getting a little crazy, it's probably because we have not pumped the brakes and recharged in prayer. Do we want to be the church? Do we desire to be the church that is out in the community loving on people? Do we desire to be the church that is going to tell everyone wonderful things about who Jesus is? Do we desire to be a church that is going to share our hurts and pains with one another, not just for it to be a sad kumbaya moment, but to lift up God and help one another? Do we desire to be a church that is going to make sacrifices for one another? If my brother is in need, if my sister is in need? Am I going to make sacrifices for them? Amen. That's the type of church God desires. Every single local body, regardless of the name, denomination, whatever the case may be, he desires for us to be this church. We are the church. God has called us to be the perfect church. He has called us to be the bride, the perfect bride. What kind of bride do you want to be? <laughs> I desire for us to be the bride that God is going to be like, that's my baby. <laughs> you catch that very white voice. I, okay, yeah. That's... <laughs> I believe God, word is leading us to build the foundation and make sure that we are doing what he has called us to do, to fellowship, to pray, to devote to his word, to worship, to pray. That's what he desires for us to be, and he desires for us to be missional to get outside of the walls and bear witness of his wonderful name. Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your son who will one day come back for us. God, we desire to be a church that you are pleased with. We desire to be that church, God, that is committed to you. We desire to be that church, God, that will come together and live our lives with one another. God, we desire to be that church 
that will devote to your words. We desire to be that church that will reach people that have not been reached. We desire to be that church that you would be pleased with. Father, we cannot do it without your power. We cannot do it without your filling. We need you right now at this very moment. God, would you please fill us and give us the power to do what it is that you have called us to do, God. And if you do that, all the glory is yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.